This is the Wally and Mathot Show. Now, here are your hosts, Brent Wallace and Mark Mathot. Welcome to the Wally Mathot Show, uh, brought to you by SportsInteraction.com. I'm Brent Wallace. He's longtime NHL defenseman, Mark Mathot, who was the one time you may not remember, uh, Eric Carlson's deep partner who happens to come into town. Matthew, you excited to see number 65 back on the ice at the Canadian Tire Center? Oddly, yes, I am. Uh, and only because the way he's been playing lately. Those first two games, um, I thought he's been very strong. We can get into that later, but um, pumped to see him. And of course, with Brady coming into the lineup tonight, it should be a big match. Okay, uh, this is an odd question, and I haven't asked about this before, but do you get like nostalgic when you see him on the ice? Do you remember back to all the times that you guys played together? Not really. I, I No, I, I get to be honest with you, I don't. Yeah. Um, I, I, I still talk to him all the time. I spoke to him a little bit yesterday and uh, prior to their game in Montreal. So uh, again, it's business as usual for him. And it's been a few years now removed, right? So yeah. it kind of wears off. The novelty of the whole thing is gone, but still a big fan of his and I'm, I'm hoping he has a big year. Do people ask you more about Eric Carlson or about Sidney Crosby? <laughs> yeah. I love how my claim to fame is correlated <laughs> to two other hockey players. <laughs> I, you know what? I'll take it. You know, I'm, I'm just fortunate enough that I played that I don't really care how I'm remembered. If it's from me losing half my finger or playing with a two-time Norris Trophy winner, I, to me, those are both compliments. I can't complain. But uh, again, uh, I think more often than not, it's Eric's being Eric's deep partner and more maybe yeah. the, the casual fan might remember me more from getting hacked off from uh, uh, Sidney Crosby. <laughs> All right. You uh, played with the last captain of the Ottawa Senators. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me. Tonight, Brady Kachuk returns, but there's no return of the captain just yet. Are you yeah. surprised they're not announcing the captaincy as we go into tonight's game? Yes, I, I guess I am. I know that I'm not in the I'm not in the front office. I'm not one of the coaches or a general manager, so I don't know what they have up their sleeve. And uh, we can only speculate at this point, right? But uh, you know, our, our good friend of the show, Mike Johnson, made a really good comment. He was pretty adamant the other day that he believes they should name somebody right now at this point. Why wait and waste it? Yes. But I, I think I'm in that camp as well. I, I don't know why you would prolong it any any longer at this point when you already know that it's likely going to be him. Otherwise, I'm sure they would have handed it to Thomas Shabbat, you know, yes. during training camp. But but all that aside, I, I you know, you got to give the benefit here or at least understand that they probably have their own little motives in the organization and maybe they want to make it a special night. I don't really know, but that's fine. We got to respect it and wait and be patient. I think as fans, we're just impatient and we've wanted to see Brady play for so long right now that, I think we're, we're chomping at the bit, as Brady mentioned yesterday. I think we feel and share that same sentiment that we want to see him out there with the Sienna sweater, and we can get, just get this over with. All right, well, a couple of things. One, the Ottawa Senators haven't proven to be the greatest marketing team in the National Hockey League. So for them not to usher out uh, Brady Kachuk, I think, is a huge miss. The other thing is the owner said, we're not going to give a captaincy to a guy on a bridge deal. So now that you've got them signed, both of them, it yeah. makes zero sense to not have Brady Kachuk storm to the ice – skate around i give me a rookie lap for that matter i know he wouldn't do it <laughs> with the c embezzled on the jersey like yeah I, I this one is a huge miss to me and i think if eric carlson coming to town he gets to skate around the c against the guy who had the former c i i i think it's a miss yeah yeah i mean and that's fair and i'm with you like i, I i'd like to see it just happen right away I mean, I don't know where the, okay. the, the, the incentive is to have him go out there wearing an, uh, an assistant here's, captain letter. It here's what I was told. Sense. Here's I was told that they don't want to burden him right now. There's too much going on. This okay. It probably weighs an ounce. Eh, it probably doesn't even weigh an ounce. Okay, but It's not Molly, going to – so as a player, hold on, as a player, yeah. are you going to have a burden having that letter on your jersey when you play? So I'm <laughs> – I'm different than Brady. So when I played, I was a little more reserved, obviously. And um, I remember my return, uh, potential return after I had a long back injury. The year I was negotiating my contract with with the Sens, I was up for uh, for re-signing with them and and extension. Um, They actually coincided my return with Daniel Alfredson's special game back where he came out in pregame warm-up with us. And the idea was to kind of shelter me a little bit. And I liked that because I didn't want to be the center of attention. So I can understand the philosophy there and that, you know, it's already a big night as it is for him being yeah. in his return, just signed a big ticket. So I can kind of understand that angle, believe it or not. And and maybe that's a conversation that they've already had with him or maybe not. But again, we're only speculating. So there is a ton of pressure on him, Wally. I can, I get that. And so to add to that, a big captaincy ceremony prior to the game, 
I mean, man, I'd, I'd want to crawl under a hole. <laughs> so uh, that's really? my vantage point. Yeah, that truthfully, that, that would be my perspective. Uh, but Brady's a different animal. And we know that he he can handle the pressure pretty well. He's a gregarious character. You know, he's very personable and has a ton of personality. So there's an argument to be made on both sides. I think at this point, you just got to go with the flow and see what the team decides to do. Uh, the Brady Kachuk return brought to you by Bonisher Excavating Inc. Go to BonisherExcavating.com. BEI, helping to shape the Ottawa Valley. Okay, so how is he going to play? And where do you see his minutes fall? Now, as we look at the lineup, we're going to see that Brady Kachuk is going to play on that top line alongside, as we all knew, Drake Batherson and Josh Norris. No right. surprise, Tim Stutzler is going to get moved down. Let's, we'll get to Stutzler in a second. But when it comes to Brady, uh, he's this isn't like he's had a preseason game here. He hasn't had a whole lot of time to get up and, and going. We know that there's going to be, obviously, some fatigue where do you see his minutes fall? Do we even notice a drop off? Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, we've read all kinds of speculation and DJ Smith came out early in, 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 the, in, the, in the paper, I believe yesterday, the day before, and he had a few quotes discussing how, you know, they don't want to throw him into the fire too soon. Of course, I'm paraphrasing here, but I think they're going to try to protect him a little bit early on, especially. And uh, if I'm coaching, I'd probably do that as well. I mean, you don't want to bombard him with a 25 minute night, I think. And, 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 and if, you know, we look over the last few games, even that second line um, anchored by Shane Pinto, they've been playing a ton of minutes. Yeah. Um, arguably more, I think. I, I'd have to look at the numbers again. So I, I think they're going to probably protect him a little bit. I know it'll be tempting for DJ to throw him out there, especially if they need a little bit of a morale boost or if they don't start really well. But I think in the perfect situation for the team, they'd have him play anywhere between 15 to 18 minutes, which to me is still quite a few minutes as a forward. Uh, but it's anybody's guess at this point, Wally. I'm not really sure if it's me, long story short, I'd protect him, not overplay him, not put him any into any uh, situation that I think would be uh, harmful towards him. Yeah. And then kind of go game by game and slowly just implement more minutes as, as we progress. Hey, here's a hypothetical. If you are a San Jose Sharks defenseman, it is Brady Kachuk's first shift. Do you just yeah. want to make sure you get out of the way because that first hit he's going <laughs> to try and put you through the glass? Yeah, he's going to come out flying. I mean, we just know it. And then we saw him. I've seen him in the offseason. He's put on some weight. He says he hasn't. I think he's just more filled out up top. Yeah. Uh, but he looks like a weapon right now. So, again, I think as a fan base, Wally, we have to remain a little bit reserved and kind of lower that expectation level a little bit. we got to give him a break. I think the amount of attention he's getting right now, if he doesn't get a hat trick in a fight, it'll be a disappointment, which is unfair. I think you're going to have to give him a couple games here to get his feet wet. I might be eating my words later at some point where he might have a couple game uh, goals tonight and a fight has a big night. Who knows? But I think we have to understand that this is his first game. He's got to get his feet under him. He hasn't played any games or exhibition games yet. So he might be a little rusty, which is completely understandable. So we have to be patient. I have lowered my expectations for Brady Kitchuk in tonight's game. Just a Gordy Howe hat trick. That's all I'm asking for. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you said you spoke to Eric Carlson. Now, I know you, I don't, you can't share everything. Have you talked to him about how he's playing? He's got four points in the first two games, tied for the team lead with San Jose. And I know it's a small sample size, and we get all excited over two games. But do you? Yeah. Is, is he a different player, do you sense, this season? Well, I watched um, – I, I got a really good look at him in that Winnipeg game, and he just had – moments in there where like you had that sh those shades of old Eric where he had that big burst out of the zone where he can evade that first four checker yeah. which essentially is one of his strengths that not a lot of people talk about where he's able to get around that one guy which creates an odd man rush almost every time um uh for his teammates so uh he, he we saw that in that first game he's very confident on the blue line as he is always and certainly the same thing applied um in his last game against Montreal where he was straddling the line really well. He was creating offensive opportunities for his teammates. You know, he's a riverboat gambler at times, and he'll he'll make some mistakes here and there. But nine times out of ten, they tend to work out in his favor, and he looks really good. So um, I we had a little conversation. We usually don't talk about hockey, though. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he wants to talk about hockey. I yeah. certainly wouldn't want to either. But the, a mixture of that and maybe losing 10 pounds in all that hair that he had cut off, Wally, that might kind of give him a little bit more of a pop and step again. So uh, he looks like a new man out there, and I'm, we're going to have to wait and see again tonight how he does. I had to do a double take on the photo. I didn't think it was real. I thought, oh, yeah, perhaps I know. this is a Photoshop of something. It was out of control. It was out of control. Like, <laughs> and I can say this, yeah. I, you know, I know him well enough. It was down to like his back, it was, and it was greasy. 
Yeah. I know he doesn't like to shampoo it too often because he likes that natural look where it can kind of be more manageable. Um, <laughs> so he doesn't shampoo that little mop too often. I think now his hair is probably a little cleaner. Uh, but uh, here we are talking about Eric's hair for a couple minutes. So uh, think of the money he's saving on where... product. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he looks good. He's moving much better. Um, you know, I think a lot of people expected him to have a bit of a step back. We know that it was a bit of a tough go for him initially there in San Jose and the expectation level was very high, understandably with that group, particularly yeah. in that decor. I mean, he's playing with Vlasic. Um, you've got Brent Burns on that back end as well. Mario Ferraro has been really good for them as well. So, I mean, they don't really have a lot of excuses other than maybe they're missing a little bit of firepower up front. But, you know, on the contrary, they've done really well so far and they're getting goals and they're getting points. So this is going to be a really good test for Ottawa tonight. This seems like the perfect time to revisit Los Angeles. I can't remember the year, but I sit yeah. down with you and Eric, one of my favorite interviews I've ever done. <laughs> I remember. And, and one of the things that came, and I, well, the one thing I remember the most, I can't remember you guys talking about hockey, was Eric's own little section in the back of the in the washroom uh just yeah. to put his own hair products <laughs> so there were, <laughs> so by the shower in ottawa um there's there's you know there's a there's a mirror with may, maybe three sinks i think it was and on the far end on the little shelf by the mirror eric would have all his hair products his gels there was like maybe four or five like nice bottles. I don't know if it was Joico or what company it was, <laughs> but we weren't allowed to touch it. And he had his number on all of them. And God forbid, if you went anywhere near those things. So Eric had them all there. That was his thing. Uh, and it kept that beautiful mop of his nice and tailored the way he liked it. And um, I think over time though, we just stopped using them because it just, I think they'd been there. They've been sitting there for several seasons even and and but that was the first memo that i got when i got there to ottawa when i was in the shower area it was like don't touch eric's stuff that's his stuff he takes it very seriously so uh hats off to him he put a lot of attention towards it and his hair was magnificent for a long time <laughs> i have i have so many questions right now I, the first question i have is who told you okay no more importantly i hate that we're spending all this time <laughs> talking about his hair like i've gone from playing in the nhl yeah. and talk and, and you yeah. know like playing with eric to now yeah. doing this Pigeon show and talking about his hair products. Yeah, I'm offended by that, but I, okay, so I just <laughs> no, want to know. I've got equal responsibility in that. So that's a chirp at all of us. I just want to know who told you. Uh, that's a good question. It would have been, well, it would have been one of the guys. It could have been like Mom. Peter Regan or it could have been, um, it could have been Smitty, Zach Smith. I, I don't okay. remember, but, but I remember seeing it for the first time and having to go out of my way and ask somebody like, what's going on with that? Can I use it? It looked like good stuff. It was better than the head and shoulders, that paint thinner that we put on our yes. hair inside the shower. Uh, okay, we're going to continue on this because there's sure. a couple things here. One is... Let's talk more about his hair. Yep. This is the stuff that people want to know. And two, yeah. um, we, we could talk about Matt Murray all day long. Two is, uh, sure. this seems ripe for a Chris Neal type of prank. This seems like you it know, should be emptied and put full of some kind of vinaigrette or something. It's... No, it's funny you say that, Neeler, that you almost had like a group, a small group of untouchables on the team. And I feel like they were always Chris Phillips, Daniel Alfredson, um, definitely Eric Carlson, maybe a goalie in there, maybe Andy. But but there were always a couple guys that were sort of off limits and Neeler never really messed with them. So I don't know if that was just like a code or an unwritten rule, but there was never <laughs> any conflict there. No one. No one took a piss in Eric shampoo or anything That's like that. Interesting. All right. Uh, yeah. Would Dion Phaneuf be in that group? No, I, I think, think Dion he... was fair game. Oh. He was fair. Yeah, because, well, because he's such a big personality. So he was kind of fun to mess around with. But ah. you didn't see it happen okay. too often, though. Dion was, for the most part, I mean, it, it's a situation where if you're going to dish it out, you're likely going to yeah. take it. Dion wasn't a pranker by any means. So he kind of kept his nose clean when it came to that. Uh, you brought up there's a, uh the types of products you guys have standard in locker rooms. This is the thing that always makes me kind of chuckle is there is a, a, a list. If you're the visiting mm -hmm. team that has to be in, whether it's the workout gear or whether it's the aftershave or the uh, razors that are in every locker room, there's a list that you have to have certain deodorants. You have to have Gillette yeah. shaving cream. Like I always laugh at this because it has to be laid out almost the exact same way. And I always just found like, couldn't the Ottawa, like, it couldn't Mark Mathot just pack his own deodorant and just go to the rink? I, well, yeah, I could, but then you'd have to walk in there with, like, a travel bag, and I don't know. We would just share. You know, when I first got into the league, 
oftentimes it was bar, like bar deodorant, right? It wasn't the spray. Oh. So we were, oh. we were like, you'd all be sharing the same deodorant <laughs> uh, when you were on the road. It was kind of grungy. But yeah. I mean, as a player, you're so comfortable with each other that you don't even really think of, about it after a while, especially sure. growing up in that atmosphere. But, but then there was a, a weird little transition period at some point when I was still playing pro and they went to the spray, the aerosol cans. So that way there was never any direct contact with each other, which was kind of nice. Yeah, no, COVID friendly before COVID even happened. Um, okay, let's, <laughs> let's move on, shall we? I think it seems yes, good right. idea, okay. Wally. Yeah. Uh, Tim Stutzla is uh, going to be bumped down to the third line, we'll call it. This is brought to you by Gong Show Gear. Go to gongshow.com, get in uh, yeah. and order some uh, Wally Mathot gear, if you will. If not, pick out a nice little new hat. Uh, Two percent mm. stock. Uh, Tim Stutzla is now going to be paired with Chris Tierney and Alex Foreman, who moves to the right from the left side. Uh, I like the lineup only because they're not going to touch the Nick Paul, Shane Pinto, Connor Brown. The line, identity I line. With. Right. I yeah. agree with that. Uh, yeah. I don't know that. Do we think that, that he's going to see much of his ice time be reduced playing on that line when you're playing with the hot hand in Chris Tierney uh, and he does get power first power play minutes or does he see a yeah. minor a little drop in his ice time? I mean, it's funny. Look, there, there are different angles here that you can look yeah. at it by, but like, or different lenses rather. But I, I'm in the boat of being positive about it. I think, you know, he's 19, he's 19 years old. He's probably still going to play 15 plus minutes tonight. Yep. Right. So, yep. I mean, and, and, and his thought process won't be the same. He's obviously going to be very competitive, which is why he's playing in the national hockey league at 19. And I was still, you know, living with a billet family in junior. So <laughs> there's a, there's a huge, there's a huge contrast there and, and, and a different mindset. But um, having said all that, I do like the line. Um, I was in the camp that, believed he would probably get slotted down to that second line um so i was wrong but i but at the same time i don't really have too many problems with him playing with forms uh formington's gonna have a bit of an issue and an adjustment to to, to make playing on that offside for him uh dj smith touched on that a little bit when you're a forward particularly a, a winger of course and you're playing on your offside defensively it can be very difficult because it's not as easy to get the puck out. You're not an easy outlet anymore standing there on your forehand for a pass. Yeah. You're going to be moving to your backhand oftentimes to chip pucks out, which can be very difficult under pressure. Um, but other than that, when they are breaking out of the zone with speed, it'll work to his advantage because when he's going one-on-one -on -one with a player on a loose puck chase, or if he has full control, he can protect the puck on his offside when he's driving the net with all that speed it makes it very hard for the defenseman to actually make contact with that, uh, with that stick on puck. So it'll work to his advantage in the neutral zone and in the offensive zone. It'll be interesting to see how he handles it in the D zone. So right. after, uh, you know, all that considered, I think for, for Stutzla, I do think it's a good situation though, because as you mentioned, Wally, Tierney's playing really well right now. He's feeling himself. He's lost some weight. He's moving really well. And, and obviously with, with Formanton on that right side, that's going to be a really dangerous line to have, particularly as a third line. So you're going to be facing oftentimes that third, uh, that third pairing on defense on the other side, which typically won't be quite as good as your top two pairs. So lots of open ice there for them. You're going to force them to have bad gap probably because they're going to have to respect your speed. Uh, so it'll, I'm, I'm curious to see how that plays out. I think it's a big advantage for the Ottawa Senators and it's a little ace up their sleeve that they can have maybe after those top two lines. And Tierney's a setup guy, right? He'd, he'd rather dish the puck and try and score. And exactly. I don't know, I'm not even sure that he's actually shot a puck that has yeah. counted in a goal so far. I, <laughs> I do like the lineup, right? I'd like to see how that plays yeah, out. It's, uh, yeah, I agree. And Chris Tierney, good for him, is starting to get some attention. I know it was a yeah. long haul last year, and I know we're into three games into the year, but I'd like to yeah. see him continue to try and keep that pace up. Um, yeah, I agree. So the big, I guess, other than... Matt, or other than Brady Kachuk coming back, Matt Murray is a pretty big storyline for today. He's going to see his first game action, and I think since April 14th of last year, uh, when yeah. that, that was his last start in Ottawa, I should say. Um, what do we expect to see from Matt Murray? This is brought to you by sportsinteraction.com. Go to sportsinteraction.com slash Wally uh, We will be picking the winner uh, in a bit with Master Domus, so uh, hang on for that. But Matt Murray's in goal. What do you expect? Pressure's on. It's as simple as that. And I'm usually in the camp. I like to kind of protect the players. I like to downplay scenarios that I believe are yep. high pressure situations or that most people believe to be high pressure. I like to usually play them down a little bit. And I think most players are like that as well, but um, man, there's no way around it. You know, I think he's in a situation now where he has to come out and be good. He has to play strong. And I don't know how long the leash is going to be because you've got a pretty darn good backup right now in the weeds, right. Waiting behind him, which is Ooh. good. 
Well, yeah, but one was sent down. But I agree with you. Yeah, you've got two guys in, in Forsberg and in Gustafson that are waiting to play, right? So um, I like that, though. I like being pushed. I think it's healthy competition. It's good for Matt Murray. It's going to push him to be to be better or to be consistent. Um, and it's not like he had a bad training camp, but, you know, he ran into a couple speed bumps here with being sick and a little injury earlier on. So pressure's on Matt Murray to, to perform. If he doesn't, you already know that Forsberg's going to be waiting thrown right in there right afterwards. So uh, it's a good scenario for the team, I think. And it's an, and most importantly for Matt Murray to reassert himself in this lineup to show the team that he's the guy that they can go to when they need him most. Okay, so I know this is tough, and I know you're a player kind of guy, obviously. Yeah. But if Matt yeah. Murray comes out and struggles, what happens, say, Saturday in the next game? Do you go, you know what? We're going to go right back to you and see what you got. Like what If well, he stumbles for a couple of games – there's going to be a massive, at least outside pressure with fans, Look, with everybody going, we need to change what's going on. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because it depends on what your expectations are for this team. Right. So if you are right. like very clearly in some form of rebuild, which technically I think they still it's over. Kind of are, it's over. but okay. Okay. And, and no, but Pierre's got to say that, right. He's trying to spark some, some buzz around the team and, um, and quite frankly, for the most part is if you're talking about all, you know, drafting and prospects, they kind of are, in a really good spot right now. Right. I mean, with the emergence of a couple more players, but let's get back to the point. I think right now, if you are in a position where the expectation level isn't very high, then I think you could afford to put Matt Murray back in there. If he does happen to have a stinker tonight, but with the way things are going around the league right now, and some of the big injuries that we're seeing long-term injuries on some of these teams that we had predicted to be very good this year, I think there's a window for Ottawa now. I know it's only been three games and I'm not trying to be dramatic, but we all know how important starts are. And, you know, if you can go, if you're over 500 here in this first month, particularly in, in Ottawa's case, you're going to give them, they're going to give themselves a really good opportunity here to perhaps make that next step, maybe make a little noise and get into the postseason. So having said all that, I think you got to go with your hot hand. I think you, you you're, they're in a position now where they can't necessarily just cater to a guy because they want him to kind of find his confidence. I think it's win now, do everything you can to win every game. The next game's your most important game. I think if Matt Murray does slip up a little bit tonight, okay, that's fine. He's still there, but you go with Forsberg. You go with your hot hand because you're playing to win every and on any given night. And we already know that DJ is approaching it this way. He did it last year. He's going to do it again this year. He wants to win now, so they're going to go with the hot hand in Forsberg depending on what happens tonight. Okay, speaking of what happens tonight, uh, what is your pick? Now, before we get to this pick, I just want to point out that you were wrong in game three, the 82 and 0 season is now officially over. So, how yeah. does Mestradamus rebound after this yeah. disastrous game three decision? Well, uh, we got to make this abundantly clear. <laughs> hockey, hockey is an absolute nightmare to predict uh, for the most part, only because there's so much parity in the league, right? You don't have super teams like you have in the NBA. It's a little bit different. So you have to try to analyze every little angle. You have to pay attention to the injuries. You have to pay attention to who's playing goal that night, whether you have home ice advantage or not. I still think tonight, I mean, I like San Jose. This is a really hard pick for me because, you know, I like Eric. I thought, I think San Jose's rolling. They're playing very well. Um, despite the, the distractions that have been going on there, I think they've been holding their own, but I think with the emergence and return of Brady Kachuk, I got to go with the home team and the Ottawa Senators. I, I'm, I'm picking a 4-3 win for Ottawa. It might go to OT. I still think we're going to see some goals here. There's going to be a lot of mo emotion in the building, but Ottawa Senators with Brady Kachuk right now, I can't bet against that. Interesting. I will say that the uh, money line right now is even, but the puck line, if you pick Ottawa at one, minus 1 1.5, you will actually win even if they do uh, lose that game by a goal. So that's interesting to yeah. note. The other thing is, though, Ottawa has owned San Jose of late. They're 5 0 1 in their last yep. six home games, and the Sens are 9 2 1 in their last 12 games against San Jose overall. Uh, here's the other question Eric Carlson is now facing the Ottawa Senators for a fourth time in his career. He has yet to record a single point against his former team. Does number 65, your former D man, your good friend, get a point tonight? Yeah, and that's a tough one because when you're playing against a team that you've played for for most of your career, and in Eric's case with the Ottawa Senators, it's always hard to play back against the, your old group. It's just it's awkward, it's weird. So you just want it's almost a situation where you want to get game over with. I experienced it when I came back to Ottawa with Dallas. I think it was dash three that night. So it just gives you a little idea how most players feel when they go back. But having said all that, 
Eric's got four points in his first two games. He's rolling right now. He's feeling himself. He's playing with a lot of confidence. I think he's moving well. I got to give him the edge here. At least give him that one point for tonight. I think he's going to get something on the power play. All right. It'll be interesting to see. That is uh, go to sportsinteraction.com slash volume of thought and, and place your bets today. Uh, coming up after the break, Meth, we've got actually, you know what? I got one more question. And sure. that is Evander Kane. You brought it up about the distraction. I want to know what that's like in a locker room to have to deal with that. And I understand uh, you guys are going to say, listen, we don't pay any attention. It's somebody else's. It's Evander Kane's problem to deal with. It doesn't affect us, which is yeah. not true whatsoever, because you guys all discuss it. It is always talked about. How do you, as a team, get around this when it's not the first time a particular player has had an issue during the time he's been with your team? Yeah, it's hard because it. no matter how much they downplay this, it's a distraction. It just is. I mean, when they're going to play a game, guess what they're talking about on the plane after the game when they're playing cards together? It's not just the hockey game that they just played. It's everything else surrounding the team. And in this case, the, you know, the, the scenario happening with, with the Vander Kane. And um, it's a bit of a mess, as we all know. And I think more importantly, um, forgetting about all the off ice antics, I think we're talking about their team leader in points last season. Like this is a significant player yeah. here. Not that the significance of a player on ice should factor in too much, but it just does. I, that's this, human this nature. Is, this is the National Hockey League. It's all about winning. So you want exactly. your best players on the so, ice. So unfortunately for them, they're dealing with this right now. And how do you how do you work around this? Like, how do you manage it? How do you navigate through it where reporters are going to be asking you questions about this after games when perhaps, you know, you were lacking in goals and you lose three one and someone comes by and says, well, well, you know, how much better would your, your team be right now with, with, you know, with the Vander Kane in the lineup. Yeah. And they're going to be facing questions like this from the media for most of the year until they kind of sort that whole scenario out. So right now, almost kind of in limbo where he's serving that 21 game suspension I think it's going to drag on a lot for this team, unfortunately, but that comes down to your leadership. So they do have some good vets on that in that lineup that I think are going to keep, you know, the, the, the focus straight and narrow, and they're going to try to keep their focus as much as they can in the games. But I, you, there's no way around it, Wally, when you're dealing with a, an extreme circumstance like this, it's going to get talked about so often and you can't get around it. So it's something that they're just going to have to learn to deal with. And I'm sure they will over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, unfair question, which is what I excel in is, do you want him gone off your team? So I had the experience to play. Like I played with Evander. I played with him at the world championships. This was years ago. He was still yep. relatively young and he was a pleasant guy. He really well, was. Yeah. I think, yeah, you know, and I liked him. Like we did workouts together and he was one of my workout partners and, you know, we'd have lunch together and he was a nice guy. Um, and I think he's a little misunderstood. And I think that, um, you know, some players just tend to make bad decisions sometimes and you get caught up in it. And unfortunately, in this, in today's landscape with all the media and social media out there, you know, the news spreads really quickly and it's unavoidable. So, um, you know, he's a victim of that, but you also have to own your mistakes and live with them and, um, and learn from them, of course. And so in this case, I, mean, I don't know what to tell you. Like I said, yeah. my experience with them was they, they were quite pleasant. I'm surprised, you know, over the last couple of seasons to see with some of the stuff that have been going on and it's very unfortunate. And I hope that he can turn it around and he can come back and figure this out. But uh, there's so much going on off ice that I hate getting into this too much. I always yeah. like to think that a player can learn from his mistakes like anybody else in life in any line of work. Um, and some stuff are more forgivable than others, depending on what the offenses are. Uh, but in this case, I mean, I just hope he can figure it out and come back because he's such a good player and he is a good guy. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes you take, you take the wrong turn in life and you need somebody to help you out. Okay, the, here's the issue I have. It's this isn't the first or the second or the third. I believe like, yeah, of, I know, of, I know of what we know you. about. This is like the fourth or fifth. And that goes back yeah. to his, all his, was his workout gear or sweatpants is out, was thrown out the bus uh, by yeah. Dustin Bufflin in Winnipeg, which like, and then it goes on to all the Las Vegas stuff. And like, it doesn't seem that either he's got the right people around him or he gets it. That's and I, a and problem. I, yeah. And I, I hate, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off yeah. there. Well, I, I was just going to say to, to your comment there, I, I hate being an apologist for a player that perhaps in some cases doesn't deserve any support. And I hate that sounds kind of odd, but we've seen players that have committed some serious issues around other sports, including hockey yeah. over the years where, you know, there's a time and place where, okay, maybe I don't have his back right now. That's, that's pretty bad what he did. <laughs> so this COVID thing that he's gotten himself into where allegedly, again, I'm only speculating, 
allegedly faked a COVID passport. Is that what, is that what the yeah. issue is? At hand? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm so conflicted with this because I can't understand why you would do that. But again, uh, I don't, I'm not there. I'm not in his mindset. I don't know what he's thinking. I don't know what he's going through off the ice. Um, so I, uh, I don't like finger pointing. Right. I don't think, I don't like being self-righteous and assuming I'm a better person than somebody else. I always like to, you know, give them the benefit Wally, but yeah, this, this whole situation is really weird. It's a new thing, right? Like where we haven't seen any other players fake a COVID passport. No. So it's bizarre. Um, I mean, of course, as we know in Canada, they've done a great job. We're all mostly vaccinated. I think it's over 90% right now. And I think almost all the NHL players are as well for the exception of a couple and, and that's their right to do what they want to do. But of course, if you're not going to get vaccinated, you're probably not going to play. So it, it's a very complex issue. It's polarizing. And a lot of people are pretty divided on this. So yeah. I'd like to try to tread very carefully with this, of, of course, but in Evander's case, it's an extreme circumstance. I don't have an answer. I mean, he's serving 21 games, Wally. He's going to be forfeiting $1.7 or $8 million. Yeah. So to me, that's a lot of money. I don't care who you are. Even if you're making $7 million in a year, that's a, <laughs> that's a shitload of money. So yeah. he's, paying, he's paying it off right now. And how they handle him when he comes back, I don't know how you can bring him back at this point. I'm sure they're probably trying to figure that out as we speak. I don't have a clear cut answer. Yeah, interesting. And regardless, think of all the taxes he saves, though, Matt. It's just a uh, joke. It's a joke. Oh well, on escrow, right? So does he avoid escrow? I don't know how that works. I, yeah, I, don't know. <laughs> I hate escrow. So we can we all can agree on that at least. The one thing that Meth and I uh, never joke about, by the way, I, and I will point this out, Meth, because it's tough to bring up Evander Kane, is we don't like to joke about mental health. And and so no. if, if it's, that's the case, we hope Evander Kane does get that help. Uh, yep. We always have a tough time trying to talk about players in that sort of situation because we don't know what's going on. Uh, even that's if right. you are playing in the National Hockey League, you never know. So uh, if there is mental health issues out there, we hope that everybody gets the help they need. And if, if it's you or somebody else, please uh, seek out someone to talk to. We'd like to point yeah. that out. Amen. Uh, Coming up after the break, a uh, good friend of the show. Uh, I've traveled the world with him a few times, and we've gone to outback places like Ufa, Russia, where uh, <laughs> we don't get into it. But I got it. I was getting a – it was in the middle of winter. Obviously, it's December, January. And I'm walking to the rink with a buddy of mine, Kurt, who uh, works at TSN. And they, the cop stopped. And he's like, do you want to drive, basically? And I was like, yeah, sure. So we hop in. As we hop in, I hand him his – sidearm his pistol that was sitting on the back seat i'm like do you want this it's like oh yeah yeah so he just puts it on the seat beside him I'm so like, okay. he, had a, he, had a, he had a he had a he had like a, a handgun in the back yeah. seat just sitting there yeah perfect was it was it loaded i don't know i wasn't about to find out yeah just gotta just gotta eject the mag wally and take a look yeah. <laughs> you for the glock <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Anyway, okay. Uh, Gordon Miller is coming up in the Whitewater chat after the break. You're watching the Wally Mathot Show. Welcome back to the Wally Mathot Show, minus the Mathot part, as he had an appointment, so Mark stepped out, uh, or he's just intimidated by our next guest. Speaking of which, time now for the chat. Quenched by Whitewater beer, enjoy a refreshing farmer's daughter, or a... Uh, Legion Lager, if you will, have Whitewater Brewery uh, in the Ottawa Valley. Order your farmer's daughter or Legion Lager today at shopwhitewater.ca or use the Wally Mathot coupon code 15% off your order. Brewed by friends, for friends, and our guest is one of my good friends. Uh, we'd like to welcome to the show Gord Miller, who is the voice of hockey on TSN. Uh, Gord, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Okay. Uh, normally, before we get into this, we always do a pre-scout board and we talk about who you are and we give a little bio. But to make it more awkward, I thought I would have you on with me as I talk about all the accomplishments through your career. Ready? Sure. <laughs> I always, <laughs> I get this a lot. Sure. A lot of times I'd be like, hey, Gordo, Wally. So I understand uh, your trepidation with me. So uh, here we go. Uh, the pre-scout brought to you by BEI, Bonisher Excavating and Helping to Shape the Ottawa Valley. Uh, Gordon Miller, born June 21st, 1965, at Edmonton, Alberta native. Uh, aside from calling all the NHL games you've done and international games and World Junior Games, uh, you've called the Olympics, the World Series, the British Open, World Figure Skating Championship, just to name a few. Five-time Canadian Screen Award nominee, mostly for That's World incorrect. Juniors. That's incorrect. Oh. That's incorrect. Eleven-time nominee have never won. <laughs> okay, I, Eleven times? Never won. So that makes you like Susan Lucci. Yes. At this point, I don't want to win. It's kind of like my badge of, <laughs> it's like my badge of honor. 
Well, uh, I believe you're one of the best play-by-play voices I've ever heard. So, uh, and I'm not just Thank sucking you. up to you. Um, and again, uh, finally, the Paul Loic Award in 2013, uh, awarded by the IIHF for your amazing contributions. Uh, and to that's international it right hockey. there. That's it right there. Actually. Ah, it's actually pretty cool. Like, I was at it's, that 2013. It weighs a lot. Like, it, it's, it's like, it weighs like 30 pounds, I think. Wow. It's, like the it's a bronze sculpture. It's like a bronze sculpture. It's, it's quite heavy. So. Let me, I, well, I'll just get to that right now then. Um, that's going to be a pretty phenomenal moment for the IIHF. You're at the, the IIHF Hall of Fame uh, Awards. I'm there, I believe, covering that event. Uh, can you just, I guess, explain or, or set that up? And I guess the uh, feeling of being awarded that. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, uh, Rene Fazel called me and, um, you know, we talk occasionally. And I was like, oh, and, and he's kind of, he missed me a couple of times. It was quite sort of insistent that he, he got me. And I was literally like, about to drive through a car wash and uh and he said uh so i kind of stopped and he told me it was uh, phenomenal so it was a great yeah it was a great honor obviously whenever you get an award you, just, you, you know it, it's an honor you say thank you i don't necessarily you know view my career through the lens of awards and honors i just kind of do what i do and uh but uh, yeah it was it was a great honor to be to be um to be uh recognized like that and uh you know, I was the last one to get that trophy. They changed it to a little crystal sort of obelisk after that. So I'm, I'm the last holder of the 30 pound bronze goalie. Nice. Sculpture. It's yeah. impressive. Um, and, and I think you got it just for being able to change the name of a tournament from U20 to the world juniors, but we'll get to that in just a second. In fact, listing all this stuff off, I feel like I'm the master starter at the tournament when Tiger Woods comes up. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but here's the best part. We do this for every show uh, for all our guests. And this one is a little, uh, I'm going to say, hits closer to home to you. It's called uh, Pearls of Wisdom, presented by sportsinteraction.com. Visit sportsinteraction.com slash volume of thought. Get in on all the action. They are Canada's odds makers. If, Gord, as you know, John Pearlberg sits next to you in the booth doing all the stuff. Well, John Pearlberg does our little Pearls of Wisdom's notes for all our guests. So this is what he's dug up on you. Uh, 582 games uh, since 2014-15 called uh, on TSN Hockey. Uh, that includes all the international stuff. 403 of those games with Ray Ferraro over that span. Uh, 26 World Junior Tournaments, including 20 as play-by-play. If any of this is wrong, by the way, you bring it up with Pearlberg. Okay. Uh, and zero jinxes by saying the word shutout in the third period. Yes. There's no, <laughs> there's no such thing as jinxes. There, there are, I mean, it's amazing... <laughs> You know, because I, I actually don't, even, you know, you're just giving information to the viewer, right? So, so this idea that a goaltender who's 250 <laughs> feet below me, you know, uh, can hear what I say. And it, let me, I, I, w- I would say this, two things. Vin Scully called four no hitters by Sandy Koufax and said no hitter throughout all four of them. He's the gold standard. Um, secondly, if my words could affect the outcome of, of events indirectly, I wouldn't be broadcasting hockey games, Wally. I'd be doing something far more important. You'd be very rich. Yes. Um, so have you ever had a goalie afterwards say anything to you? No. In fact, there's a famous YouTube video of me uh, talking about no jinxes, and Carey Price gets scored on right afterwards. And and Carey and I talk like a week later. He's like, it's ridiculous. <laughs> because the, the, the thing is, people say, well, you'd never say it on the bench. Right, because the goalie can hear you. <laughs> unless he's got cable in the crease he can't hear me he just knows um, it though he feels your energy he just feels my my, my negative juju um <laughs> so so I, I do find it kind of funny that people still still cling to that um yeah. i don't consciously say it or not say it i just you know the other night i think i was uh, i was doing an ottawa game and talking about how um uh someone had never had a shutout it was forsberg yeah anton forsberg yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, I mean, well, he and had two, and then two minutes later, they scored or something, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know what else, but, <laughs> but I mean, whether I'd, whether I'd said it or not, that goal would have been scored. Yes, I agree. I just like people get wound up about that stuff. And so people I just get wound curious, up about everything. Well, that's so, so yeah. I don't, I, so I don't really pay attention to social media very much. So I, I don't know what, you know, people are going wild about or saying, yeah. um, but um my job is to inform the viewer. So, so and entertain. I, I, I want to go back. So um, you started covering uh, uh, 
uh, you worked at radio CBC, you worked at radio and then you worked at CBC in Edmonton. You were covering a guy named Wayne Gretzky back in 1984. So how did you know that eventually, and you got to TSN at 1990, uh, how did you know you wanted to call hockey games? Uh, I mean, it was something I'd always wanted to do. I didn't have the opportunity in Edmonton. I was working for CBC TV and, and, and doing some stuff for, for the network, but it was always hosting. And it wasn't until I got to TSN that they, they said, we, we'd like you to do some play-by-play. And, uh, and so I did. Um, and it kind of came in fits and starts because I was so busy with you know, everything I was doing. I did the NBA. I did NBA play-by-play for a while. Um, and then I started as a CFL play-by-play, did hockey in the early 90s. And then I kind of became more of a host because I did the World Junior as a host. Yep. And, uh, and then it wasn't until um, I became a full-time play-by-play guy in, in 2002, so almost 20 years ago. Because you were the, when I joined in 98, you were the host of That's Hockey. You'd taken over for Dave Hodge. Uh, right. And, and did a phenomenal job. And so I, I didn't, I didn't even see, I guess I didn't even see it coming that you would en- eventually be a, a full-time play-by-play. I just thought you were so good at hosting that show that that's what you, I guess, ultimately wanted to do. But I completely Well, so, so what happened was we, got, <laughs> we lost the NHL rights in 98. And so I hosted That's uh, Hockey. And then in 2002, we got them back. And, uh, and they said, you're going to be our play-by-play voice. And, and so that was the World Junior and, and the NHL. So I've been doing both since then. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's important you know, for young broadcasters not to, not to pigeonhole yourself, right? Do, do lots of different things, you know, and uh, report and, and host and, and try play-by-play. The hard thing with play-by-play is the advantage I had, Brent, is that, you know, TSN used to have junior hockey. So I did – hundreds and hundreds of junior hockey games uh, i did cis what was then the ciau mm. which is now u sports i think but u sports yeah whatever yeah. it is <laughs> yeah they, they've had a they've had a bunch of bad names it's and, not um, a good marketing yeah n- no um and um and so i i did a ton of those we don't have that much stuff anymore so it's hard for someone at tsn to cut their teeth like that um and so yeah i i, I like being versatile um, it was funny, you know, I, w- I was hosting at TSN in the late nineties, but doing play by play for ESPN on football and some hockey. So, so that was kind of a funny juxtaposition. I did the gray cup for ESPN for a few years. Um, oh, I didn't know which, that. Yeah, it was kind of fun. Yeah. So what's your favorite event outside of hockey to cover or, or has been, cause you've done, well, I, I, we should get to the Olympics right now. And you covered Usain Bolt, the track and field in 2012, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. And all the other stuff that I know, like the British Open or World Series, and like, is there a particular event that you would like? This is I. This was the my coolest event. Yeah, I would say uh, two things: the World Cup soccer in '98. I reported on the World Cup in '94 and '98. Uh, World Cup France '98, where where France won the tournament on home field against Brazil, was astonishing. Just an incredible. We drove through the south of France for a month and a half. Uh, went to 31 matches. We were in a van the whole time. Um, <laughs> our producer was a guy named Dominic Vanelli, who's now the head of RDS. Um, and uh, it was amazing. So there was that. I think, you know, the Olympics in London in 2012, we did every run, every jump, every throw for the course of that Olympic track and field meet. It was incredibly challenging. You know, there's, there's like 1,500 athletes in track and field. Um, but, you know, the Saturday night at the Olympic Stadium, when Great Britain won three gold medals in 40 minutes, um, Jessica Ennis won the heptathlon, um, Greg Rutherford won the long jump, and Mo Farah won the 5,000 meters. And there's 105,000 people in that stadium who just never stopped cheering. It was one of the most incredible nights of my life. And, uh, and I, you know, I've been blessed to have lots of great hockey moments, and there's, there's too many to, you know, to, to count. But that, yeah. that night in London, and to, and to call it live, you know, and, and because what people don't realize about track and field is that there's so much going on at once, right? And yep. so, um, you know, Ennis won the heptathlon, and they they stopped the long jump because the you know the crowd was going so wild, and then Rutherford boom um, wins the long jump, you know, and they're going crazy about that. And then, you know, as that's going on, other jumpers are going, and then the crowd realizes that Rutherford's going to win it because no one's going to catch him. And they had to stop. They had to hold the start of the 5,000 because the crowd was going wild. And so Farah kind of points over at Rutherford and Rutherford points back at him. And then Farah goes out and wins the 5,000. It was just, it was unbelievable. 
That's pretty cool. I, how much prep do you have to do for Olympics? I, I know the amount of work that goes into hockey and I can't imagine because obviously you don't cover the Olympics on a daily basis, what kind of workload that is to cover. And you're covering the main event with Usain Bolt in the 100 plus all the other track and field that's going on. Yeah, it was, it was two years. It <laughs> was, it was, it was basically there was time every day for two years that I put into that. And because you're just, you're learning it, you're watching it. Um, I went to the world track and field championships in South Korea the year before, you know, you're talking to Canadian athletes. You're just trying to learn who the, sorry, I'm going to move this a little bit because I got the sun streaming in here. Um, but you're just trying to learn the athletes and who they are. And, um, you know, it's, um, it was, it was a huge challenge, which is, which I love. That's the thing I loved about it. it was, was what a great challenge it was. Uh, do you have a favorite call uh, of all time? And my guess, I, I'm going to guess what it is, and I, I could be way off. And I'll say like the Jordan Eberle 08 mm -hmm. World Juniors or 09 World Juniors in Ottawa. But is there one that really stands out to you? That's the one that people talk about the most. Um, there, there is probably not a week goes by. Um, <laughs> Literally, winter, summer, doesn't matter. that Someone doesn't mention that. Um, and, and so uh, I get asked all the time, you know, did, uh, did I rehearse that? Yeah, because in my hotel room that day, I thought, what if Canada <laughs> scores with five seconds left to tie the game? What, what, how would that be? So um, uh, that, that's the one people talk about the most. Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't really think of it that way. I, I just, yeah. I honestly... I just do every game. I don't plan. You know, I, I try to, I guess what I try to do, Brent, is I don't go into the game with a preconceived notion. Just, just go in sort of expecting, you know, because you don't know what's going to happen. So don't, don't go in sort of with a, with a preconceived idea of, what, of what's going to happen. Do you ever practice or write out or think of lines at the end of a game that you should say? Never, never. Do you have a call? I remember Doc Emmerich, when he was retiring, uh, they allowed him to call the uh, winning goal from the 2010 Stanley Cup final because that's the Patrick Kane one mm -hmm. that went in the side of the net, right? Uh, he got to recall it because he said that was the one call he wished he could redo. Is Do you have one? Um, sure. Pro probably lots, yeah. I mean, I think you always wish you could do – you always – I mean – it's live. Right. So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's never, you don't, you don't get to do it over and over again. It's not like doing a movie where you do take after take until it's right. Um, I, I think that's, you know, you, you sort of, you're sort of chasing that perfect game and you'll never have it. You'll never have a, you'll never do a perfect game. And that's kind of, the, that's one of the things that's so appealing about it is, is that, and it doesn't matter what you've done before. It doesn't matter. You've done thousands of games before, you know, the next game. So, you know, Thursday night, I've got Ottawa, San Jose, and you don't prepare any differently for that than you would for game seven of the Stanley Cup final or a gold medal game at the Olympics or, or whatever else. You just, you do every game sort of on it. It's, it's, it's its own event. One of the things I love about live TV is the red light. And once the red light comes on, it's the adrenaline rush. Do you still get that same adrenaline rush every time the broadcast begins? Sure. Because um, my daughter, um, is laying in wait for me to become a YouTube sensation for some kind of mistake. So, uh, <laughs> so um, I think that, you know, I, I covered the Oilers in the eighties and, and was around that group a lot. And, and one of the things I learned from, from being around guys like Gretzky was that you, Gretzky always said, there's no such thing as big game players. There are players who treat every game like it's a big game. And so when the big moment comes, it's no different for you. You don't have to adjust. It's, it's, you, you've treated everything the same way. And I, I think one thing I try to do is no matter what game I'm doing, you prepare the same way, approach it the same way, so that when those big games come, it's, it's no different for you. I mean, I, you know, Ray Ferraro and I did San Jose Vegas game seven together for NBC a few years ago, which turned out to be one of the most incredible playoff games of all time. But I'll prepare for the game Thursday night Ottawa, San Jose, the same way I prepared for that. This is what I, and I, I'm going to take the chance now to say, I, you provide, and as TSN does, these regional broadcasts, a, a complete NHL full production package. You guys do a phenomenal job of a national broadcast. So I, and I just, I want to say like, you guys deserve all the credit you get for the way you guys put a show on. 
uh, for the fans in Ottawa. They're very fortunate because they don't get that across the country. So to have you calling a game and Jamie McLennan and Mike Johnson and all those guys putting that show together, you do a phenomenal job. Um, Thank you. I, I will say, uh, is it weird to call games with sons of players you used to call games for? Like, let's say Keith Kachuk and now Brady Kachuk. Well, I did, you know, it's funny at the world championship last spring in Latvia, the United States had four players whose dad's games I had called like four of them. Um, a couple of years ago, I had my first player at the world junior, whose dad game I called at the world junior. Oh. Um, yeah. So that's kind of sobering, right? <laughs> <'Cause> that, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it is, I think that the the most interesting part of it, Brent, is that is the arc of of their career and your career. So I did I did Scott Niedermeyer's junior games, and 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 covered him at the Olympics and in the NHL and and you know the World Championship and everything else. And so over the course of my career which isn't over yet. He, he had a full career, including induction into the hall of fame. Um, and, and, and that's, and that keeps going on now. You know, the players that I first called the world junior uh, in 2002 are, are mostly retired now. Um, you, you know, um, none of the players at this world junior obviously were born when I started calling play by play of it. So uh, speak. Go, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So that, I mean, I, I, my, my first play by play game full time, I did a couple in the nineties, but the first full time play by play game I did for TSO, the world junior was Christmas day, 2001. So, so this is the first year, this coming world junior, the 2022 world junior, none of the players were born when I did that game. It's wild. Um, but let's, you know what, then I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears to, how does Gordon Miller celebrate Christmas with his family? I know occasionally you get to do it at home. There are the odd times, but all these. This is driving me crazy, by the way. This sun <laughs> beaming in is just driving me can nuts. You, can you so not I, I afford can, a curtains? I, I could, but I would have to stop and pull the curtains down. So, uh, <laughs> I would think terrible. you'd have motorized ones. Uh, yeah, I should have. How do you celebrate Christmas with the family when, you know, your daughter was really young and I'm assuming she was, did she ever get used to you not being around? She, she, well, she, she came, so she's 16. She'll be at the world junior with me this year. She's been to 14 of them now. So I remember one of her first ones, we were in Prague in, uh, so with the 2008 world junior. So Christmas, 2007, she was three years old and she bolted up in the middle of the night and said, dad, Santa doesn't know where we are. What's going to happen when he comes to give us our gifts and we're not there and there's no food for him? And I said, it's okay. I let him know like, that we're in Prague. She's like, oh, okay. She went right back to sleep. Now I'm staring at the ceiling for the next four hours. Yes. Um, um, it's, it's different, obviously. Um, I would never complain. And I, and I get asked this a lot. I would never complain about you know, being, working at Christmas and being away at Christmas and New Year's. Lots of people work at Christmas. Police officers, firefighters. Uh, EMTs, you know, lots of people work the holidays. So I would never complain about being fortunate enough to to cover this tournament, which is such a a big part of so many people's lives. I mean, it's it's amazing how many people, you know, say to me over the course of a year that we're part of their family tradition, and and that's the greatest compliment that that I can be paid is is that that people view that event. And our coverage of it is such is, is sort of part of their family and uh, or their family uh, event for the holiday. So that's I would never complain about it. It's certainly different, um, but she grew up with it and she likes it. And she's going to bring a friend this year to Edmonton, and you know she she loves it. Uh, good for Blair. I missed one uh, 2013. I think it was Ufa Russia, and my daughter uh, was not very happy with me. She was uh, upset, and I I get it. And but I like you don't. When you look back, you're like, man, that experience you have when it's Ufa Russia and it's a completely different world, you'll never be able to replicate that. So I, the, the memories you get from that stuff, there is some sacrifice, but uh, to be able to travel the world 
and do that kind of stuff is, is a ton of fun. Um, so that was, that was, so that was, that was, that's my greatest, one of my greatest Ray Ferraro stories is from that one where he, um, <laughs> he, he Christmas Eve, he, he knocked on my door and threw his phone at me and said, my phone doesn't work. So I looked at it, I said, yeah, your, your data's locked. That's weird. So I called back to Bell IT and I, I said, you know, Mr. Ferraro's phone, they, they, you know, they're typing up. Yeah, there was a data anomaly. So it automatically shuts down. I'm like, Ray, did you, did you download something? Goes, no. Oh, I, I streamed Landon's American League game last night. I said, you, you streamed an American Hockey League game on roaming in Russia? I yeah. think we, I think we found the problem. That's hilarious. I, I do. It was a, it was a ridiculous amount of money, if I'm not mistaken. He ended up, the, well, the bill was, uh, but yeah, I think, I think it got, I think it got. Yeah. Yeah. I think Bell may have taken care of it. Um, which remind Ray would sometimes watch, I know, land and play when he was calling play games in the, in the box uh, at sense games, which I would do too. If my son's playing the national hockey league, but do you remember, I, did you call that game with Landon in Ottawa? Was that you alongside Ray? Uh, his first I, NHL game. I no, think his first, well, his first NHL his game first. was in Detroit. His first right. NHL game was, I did, I did the one where he scored um, for Boston against Toronto in Boston, Ray interviewed him. That was a pretty cool night. Yeah. Like those memories are pretty neat to have, right? Well, for Ray, I mean, that's, I mean, yeah. imagine, you know, I mean, I, I think it's extraordinary. Ray's had two amazing careers. He was a great NHL player. Now he's a great NHL broadcaster. So it's rare to have one of those careers, never mind two. Yeah. We're hoping to have him on next week, by the way. We wanted to do back to back Ray and Gord. We felt that was the way to go. Um, it, when you, uh, Think back to that start of the World Juniors, and I, I didn't mean to spend this much time on it, but the World Juniors is such a big thing. It was called the U20 tournament, at least I think it was back then, because uh, of yeah. all international events are all U18, U20, whatever. Uh, did they get upset with you because yes. it started to get <laughs> – because yes. it ended up being called the World Junior in Canada, but it was always the U20 everywhere until, I don't know, was it 10 years ago they changed it maybe? Uh, if that? I have to, uh... So I can tell you, because um, I have the pucks here, uh, 2009, Ottawa was the first oh. year the puck said World Junior Championship. That's, so that's so, so I, we just kept banging away at it. And they're like, the IHF is like, why do, why do you keep calling this the World Junior? U20. I said, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's just not. It, and nobody ever called it. No, well, not North America anyway, the U20 tournament. It's just, yeah. It's always the World Juniors. So thank, hey, you know what? That might be one of the greatest contributions you made is to change the name of the tournament. Well, you know, unless I find a cure for some disease, I guess that'll yeah. have to be it. Well, well, maybe tomorrow. Uh, yeah. You, I, if everything I read online is true, uh, which we know it isn't, we're a political activist in junior high at uh, Edmonton City Council. Can you? Uh, uh, that, uh, that is true. Um, that is absolutely true. Uh, so what happened was um, the city of Edmonton was going to pass a curfew bylaw. Everyone under 14 had to be, you know, couldn't be out after 10 o'clock at night. So a group of people, a group of young people in Edmonton were, were fighting it. And um, I had been contacted. One of the guys, I went to high school with one of the guys, or went to junior high with one of the guys. And so we, we all went out and gathered these petitions. And we went to speak to city council. The, the, the ringleader who was supposed, supposed to speak to the council got stage fright. He couldn't go on. So I did. So I spoke to city council. And, um, and actually, uh, a university friend of my father's, uh, a counselor named Percy Wickman, who's the late Percy Wickman, um, encouraged me to, be, to, to speak and uh, was very supportive afterwards and actually gave him my first job out of high school. Percy was in a wheelchair and he hired me to be his assistant and he encouraged me to go into broadcast. He's the one who encouraged me to, to go to broadcasting school and to go into broadcast. So all uh, of that sort of led, one thing led to another. Yeah. Interesting. So would you ever consider politics at the end of your broadcasting career? No, uh, I've been asked, but uh, no. Uh, I think it's too late now. I'm 56. I, I like what I'm doing too much. Um, I don't know, Joe Biden seems to be doing okay at 80. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but he was a senator for like 35 years. <laughs> he was a senator when he was like 30 years. Um, so, um, no, I, I think that I have a great interest in politics. One of the reasons I love going to Ottawa so much is I have lots of friends in politics. It's always good to catch up with them. Um, 
and I, I have a deep interest in it. I've never, I've never uh, disclosed my political leanings, and I, I would hope that people wouldn't be able to, to, to say, oh, for sure he's yeah. this or that or the other thing. Um, but I, I, I'm deeply interested in, in public affairs and, and current affairs, and, and uh, yeah. So, but no, I don't think I would run. Totally see you as a Green Party guy. Um, is the there is, uh, I, no here, so sorry? There is a yeah. there is a Gord Miller. Uh, who, who runs for the Green Party all the time? He, he was he was the former Environment Commissioner of Ontario, and and he and I have actually met, and and we joke about it because, uh, and and someone stole one of his campaign signs. I think he ran up uh, in like Muskoka or somewhere, and someone stole one of his signs and put it on my lawn. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Um, you're old school. Let's put it this way: you don't like. To call it a hockey jersey you don't call it the locker room um why can't you loosen up and call it a jersey and call it the locker room and not a dressing room i do i mean i i, I <laughs> bob McKen bob mckenzie was more on that than i i i do i am i am old school about something it's not assistant captain it's alternate cap i agree yep yeah um there are there are some things that that i do um um I do say sweater instead of jersey, even though they are kind of jersey material. Uh, I should probably, but I just, I've always said sweater. Um, it is the dressing room. In hockey, it is the dressing room. So I think that, um, you know, especially when I was doing games for NBC, you, you want to make sure that certain things like, you know, it's the morning skate, not the skate around. It's, mm. it's offside. It's offside, not offsides. Um, you know, there, there are certain things. And yeah, I am. I'm old school about some things, yeah. And 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 again, my daughter would tell you, and rolling her eyes, that there are some things that I'm probably too old school about. But <laughs> yeah, I, I I I do think that there are some things that that you know should be. I'm, I'm a stickler for grammar. I bust Gregor all the time for grammar, right? Ottawa's an it. The Senators are a they. Yes. Ottawa scored its first goal. The Senators scored their first goal. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm a stickler for that. My mom was a, a high school teacher at the beginning. She was like, Brent, I'm telling you this once. It is Ottawa is a place. It's an it. I'm like, yeah, got it. And so I've always, I totally agree with you on the it and they part. Um, but every once in a while I screw it up and then I feel. Oh, shy. I do too. I mean, it was when you're talking for three hours live, it's not always going to be the queen's English. Like it's <laughs> so true. Okay. What's the one name that you always hated to see on paper? Was there one? Um, no, not, not really. Like I, it's funny because, well, people always say to me, how do you get those names right at the world junior? And I always say, well, you don't know those players. How do you know I'm right? Like <laughs> I could be saying, I could be saying anything. Um, um, there was a guy, uh, Deviracinski and he, he always had the fuck. And that was a long one. The, the funniest one was, and of course, Ray is, is a 10 year old. So <laughs> there was a guy, we were doing the world championship in St. Petersburg, Russia. Hungary was playing. And there was a guy whose name was Bense. His first name was B-E-N-C-E. -E. His last name was S-T-I-P-S-C-H-I-T-Z. S-T-I-P-S-C-H-I-T-Z. Yeah. So it's Bense. And I said to the Hungarians, is it steep sheets? No, it's stip sheets. I'm like, oh, could it be stip sheets? No, it's stip sheets. <laughs> so... So, of course, Ray is constantly giggling at me when I'm because he was their best player. He had the, whenever they had the puck, he had it, and and so he he wrote me a note during one of their games and said, "I'll give you fifty bucks if you say stip shits dumps it in the corner," and <laughs> and of course that cracked me up. It cracked him up. I couldn't look at him, um, and he just he just loved it. He just he thought that was the funniest thing he'd ever seen, and. He's terrible though. So um, I don't, once you learn kind of like, you know, Stan Netzcash in Ottawa was, was a famous mm. one, right? Like, um, N-E-C-K-A-R. But once you learn the kind of linguistic uh, stuff, it's not that hard. The, the trick is, and we go through this all the time, is how do the guys want it said? So mm. the other night, uh, who was the guy in, um, oh, for Dallas, Jacob Peterson. What's well, Jakob Pedersen? He's Swedish, but he wants to be Jacob Peterson. If that's what he wants to be, that's that's what I'll call him. If Igor Shosturkin from the Rangers wants to be Shosturkin instead of Shosturkin, which is closer to what it actually is in Russian, 
then I'll say it the way he wants. If you want to be Brent Wallace, then you're Brent Wallace. Uh, well, isn't the Miranoff brothers the famous one? That like, uh, Boris wanted Miranoff and the other guy wanted Anton wanted Moranoff. Well, there was also the um, oh the two, the the two brothers, uh, the Czech brothers, the defensemen, um, who couldn't decide how to say it. Uh, one played in Arizona, right? And uh, yeah. yeah, and I was like, guys, go play golf, play cards, whatever, and just come back with one way to say it. Yeah, figure just figure it out. Yeah, I yeah. I, the name pronunciation thing is always fun uh, when you sit on the outside and watch people get so wound up over how you oh, say a name. Well, and Simon Zemberg, so, right, is is classic. You know, Simon, Simon, son, right. Simon, Simon's a pal of mine, and he's he's old school from Europe. Um, so uh, we don't say we don't say Paris, we don't say Roma, we don't say München, we say Paris, we say Rome, we say Munich. So we do anglicize names to a point, but we do respect linguistic differences. And I'm happy to say a player's name any way they want to say it. It was the McCall, it was the Mahalik brothers. Oh, one was, Milan. one was, one was, one was McCulloch and one was Mahalik. Drove right. me nuts. Yep. And we, we had that in Ottawa and they would come to town. And we're like, well, what do you guys want? And they're like, we don't care. Can you just, well, that's a, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's uh, move on to uh, working with Ray. And so you've brought him up a few times. Uh, it may be the greatest duo ever outside of actually working because watching the two of you interact outside of hockey is my favorite part. And whether it's dinners or walking down the street, um, it's obviously not, you don't get to work as much with him anymore now that he's at ESPN, but I know you'll be doing world juniors and, and the double well, and, and the world and championships. And the Leafs, and the Leafs, and the yeah. Leafs, Leafs games. So I, I still work with him quite a bit. Uh, if you had to sum up, other than a 10-year-old, how would you sum up Ray Ferraro uh, travel person? <laughs> so here's the, here's, here's the funny thing. And, and people say to me all the time, like, you know, is, is Ray really grumpy? Like, is it really, you know, the answer is we've worked together for, I guess, nearly 15 years now. I mean, I, I see him all the time. We've never had a fight. To my, like, I can't recall one. I, we've had a couple, we've probably had a couple of times where one of us said, you know what, I'm just going to eat my room tonight. Like just sort of small circle day, yeah. but we've never, we've never like, when I think of working with Ray, I think of laughing. Like we just, we just have a ball together. Now he's disorganized. He is complete, like directionally challenged. Doesn't even begin to describe like he, he get lost in a bathroom. I'm sure. <laughs> um, so, so there is the, like there's always these misadventures. And I remember one time we were flying it was a couple of years ago, we we're flying to the world championship and he missed his flight uh, to Vienna. So TSN called me and said, Ray's missed his flight. Would you mind waiting for him to arrive? I said, well, how long is that going to be? They said six hours. I said, you, you want me to wait six hours for him? I said, yeah. And she said, we don't want Ray trying to find the train station on his own in Vienna. <laughs> It's a very good so, point. So it, it actually waiting six hours probably saved me time. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, we just honestly, like he's, he's, he's really good at what he does. He's yeah. phenomenal at what he does. He's so prepared. Uh, he knows the game so well. He has a great way about him of, I think he focuses on skill because there's a mistake on every goal. So if you want to crush guys all the time, you can do that. If there's a bad mistake that leads to a goal, he'll certainly point it out. But for the most part, he tends to focus on the skillful plays, which which he likes. Um, he's he's a great person. We just like we just laugh. We just have a great time. And and people look at us, I think, you know, and just kind of roll their eyes because we have all this shorthand and all these sort of inside jokes that we you know. And he's he's a relentless needler. Um, he is. He is a relentless practical joker. Um, we just have a, we have a ball together. And, and um, y- you know, uh, I was thinking about it. We went up, we were in uh, the Czech Republic a few years ago for the World Junior. It was in Ostrava. We were in Brno for a pre-tournament game. And uh, so I figured, let's go up and see his son play. So we drove up to Berlin and watched Landon play and then drove back. And at the end of that trip, I remember thinking uh, it was too bad it was over. And we'd been in the car for like 12 hours together. And just... You don't even notice it. And, and Cammy, you know, his wife, Cammy always laughs like, 
We'll get back from like a one month trip and be on the phone the next day. And she'll be like, what could you two possibly have to, <laughs> have to talk about? Yeah, cut the cord. That's good. Um, World Juniors, uh, you've, you're very vocal about, you think the 18 year olds should go back and play, whether it's junior or whatnot. Um, Cockney Emmy, I think was one recently that you may have mentioned. You're, what do you think on Tim Stutzla? Uh, did you think he should join the NHL or uh, did you think he should go back? Well, I think that was a unique case for a couple of reasons. Number one, he'd played in the men's league the year before and, and done really well. I, I just think what you need is you need, in Kakanyemi's case, he'd never scored more than nine goals for any team he'd played for. You need to have that foundation to fall back on. You need to have something that you can say to yourself, okay, I've done this before. You know, like if Shane Pinto struggles for Ottawa or Josh Norris, they have something to fall back on, right? That they, they, where they succeeded in the past. And so I think Stutzla has that to fall back on. Every player is going to go through slumps. Every player is going to go through a scoring drought. Every player is going to have a string of bad games. That's, that's the way the game works. I don't care if you're Alex Ovechkin, Sidney Crosby, Wayne Gretzky, or, or whoever you are, you're, you're going to have those. And the question is, how do you, how do you respond to them? And, and so I think you need to have that foundation. So that's why I argue for 18-year-olds, look, go dominate. Go back and dominate. Now, in Stutzler's case, the German league wasn't really playing. There, there wasn't really somewhere for him to go. So I thought, I thought he was fine in the NHL. You know, I, I thought he did fine. So um, he'll be 20 what, in, in January. Yeah. So, um, but no, I think he's fine. But, but again, he was, you know, 19 when he played in the NHL and he'd been really good in Mannheim the year before. Uh, do you like the makeup of this? Uh, you've watched the senators obviously all the time. Do yeah. you like the makeup of what they started to put together? I think their back end is a little bit needs some work, but you can see the pieces and you'll see another piece uh, as you call Brady Kachuk returning to the ice here tonight. Yeah. They need, uh, you know, look, they're, they're young. So there's going to be some tough nights when, you know, look, Shane Pinto and Josh Norris are two terrific young players, but they're kids. And, and you, you know, you're going to go up against veteran players, um, you know, so when you're facing off against Logan Couture and then, you know, the, 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 a couple of days later, you're up against Mika Zibanejad, you're, you're up against veteran players who know their way around the rink. Um, it's just hard. And I, yeah. I think that I hope people in Ottawa are patient because, it, you know, there are what I would say green shoots, right? There's, there's, there, there's green shoots of grass poking up here, you know, from the, from the ground but it's a long way before you got a lawn. And, and so you got to be patient here. And um, I, I, but I think, you know, Jake Sanderson going back to college is a great move. Um, I, I just think that it's going to take some patience because they're really young and, you know, maybe they, they can go get a veteran center, you know, one more guy to kind of stabilize things and, and, and uh, take some face-offs in key situations, but that's how you learn too. So it just, it's just going to take time. The, the question is going to be, you know, down the road, if these guys all pan out the way they think they are going to pan out, is there room for everybody? Should Brady Kachuk already be wearing the C? See, I don't care who's the captain, who's not. I really don't. I, I think we put way too much on that. I, I don't think his, his status in the dressing room has is, is not changed one bit, whether he's got an A, a C, or, or nothing on his sweater. Um, so, um, I, I don't, I, I think, I think outside people put way too much on, uh, when you're seeing nights, it's tough for Ottawa. And I know that you're the, we'll call it the host broadcaster for sense games. Obviously, mm -hmm. do you have to change the way you broadcast a game to not be all over them? I, so you get, does, I'm going to assume it doesn't matter what game you do. You'll get Homer called by one team or the other, right? That's wherever mm -hmm. you make a call. But do you have to call your game differently based on how the game is going? Does that make sense? Um, I'm not really that cognizant of it. I, I kind of call the games the same way. I, I guess you're you're somewhat aware that you're speaking to an Ottawa audience. Yeah. But if someone hasn't scored in 15 games, I'm going to say they haven't scored in 15 games. I don't work for the club. Um, you, you know, so um, my job is to call the game and and you know give people information and, and entertainment. So I don't really view it that way. Um, you know, I, I guess there are some fans who would like an over-the-top homer. They want that rah-rah call. Mm. That's not really my style. Uh, and the broadcasters that I admire don't really do it that way. Um, so, 
yeah, I, I'm not, I just call the game. I just, I just call it straight. And I, you know, I hope that people can't tell which teams I like, which players I like or don't like. I just, I just call the game. Well, it's, it's, it's fascinating how people get so wound up thinking that you cheer for one team or the other. I like for me, it doesn't matter who I grew up cheering for. Once you get into the NHL and you start to meet players and deal with players, you end up just actually looking and hoping certain players do well or the buddies you like, not necessarily the franchise or the organization, right? Like, I don't know what's the same for you, but like, I will always cheer for guys I've met who have been very good to me over the years. And I don't care which team they play on. Yeah. I think that I want, I want everyone to do well. I, I hope that, yeah. you know, I, I hope that, I hope that everyone has a good career. And one of the reasons I'm so outspoken about young players is it's so hard to play in the NHL. And, and I've seen so many guys confidence get ruined by playing too soon. And so I guess that's why I'm outspoken about that. Um, I, I think that, yeah, you, you want all these young guys, all these players to a be healthy and, and to do the best they can. It's not going to work out for everyone, but I, I, I think it's very easy to sit back and throw rocks and be critical all the time and say, that guy's no good. That guy's no good. If you're playing in the NHL, chances are at some point you were the best player in your team, probably for, a, for several teams. And, and I think that that, you know, I have great respect for the, for how difficult it is and, uh, and how hard it could be. And so that's kind of how I view it. I agree. I, I look at Chris Neal went down to the AHL during the lockout was scoring hat tricks. Like we always talk about, Oh, they're fourth liners. They, you know what, take them outside the NHL and they're very, very skilled hockey players. And that's the one thing people always seem to miss and forget. Well, it's like saying about Olympia. Wow. You know, he finished 15th in his race. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so he's the 15th best person in the world yeah. at that. Hmm. So I, I do think it's easy to sit back and, you know, from your, from your couch and say, Oh, that guy sucks. And that guy's no good. And I, well, they might not be as good as you want them, but you know, and no, and no player's perfect. Right. But fans yeah. get, I, you know, fans get very emotional and, 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 and that's part of the, the passion that we love about sport. Um, my, I, I view my role to be a little more dispassionate sometimes, a little more objective. Uh, a couple of quick questions before we let you go. One is, uh, do you have a favorite snack that if you're watching uh, a movie or uh, something Ray has done on YouTube, uh, what do you sit down with uh, that you cheat with here? Yes, cheese is my kryptonite. Um, if you put cheese in front of me, I will eat it. Um, uh, the hot dogs at, at the, uh, at the Canadian Don't. tire center, uh, they used to have a hot, they had a hot dog roller, yeah. um, upstairs in the press box. Um, I, I, it took a lot of will, they don't have it anymore, but it took a lot of willpower not to go crush a hot dog every first intermission. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm trying to eat healthier. And so I bring snacks to the rink now i don't i try not to what what is gord miller bringing to the rink now in his snack bag it's it's embarrassing i bring <laughs> chewy granola bars i'm, trying to say, I'm like the word it's, it's ridiculous I, I bring chewy granola bars uh hey I, if that's what makes you feel better that's i'm okay i'm having like i'm having smoothies for breakfast and i mean like, it's ridiculous like i'm the new gourd i like it well i'm well the old gourd was a little yeah <laughs> The old boy um, needed to shed a few. So, uh, the uh, Halloween's coming up. I'm curious what your favorite all time costume you wore uh, when you went out trick or treating is. Uh, I went on the air as the Joker once. Oh, on CBC. I, I, this. I, I was years ago at CBC. I went on as the Joker. Uh, my friend. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I, I, you know what I, you, you know what I wear at trick or treat now. I have a, I have a toque which has a knife in it in the head <laughs> with, with like blood dripping out. Yeah, I just I wear, I wear all black and throw that on. It's it's easy and the kids love it. So you'd still dress up now when you answer the door. Is that what you're saying? Just a, just a toque with a knife. Okay, I appreciate the effort. Um, finally, before we let you, is there is the one I guess uh, thing you're missing is to call a Stanley Cup final. Is that what you still want to have left to do? No, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, it's funny, you know, uh, years ago, I was at a, a dinner at the Olympics in Salt Lake City, and Jim McKay was there, the legendary Jim McKay from ABC, and he wasn't, he wasn't hosting, and someone said to him, you know, are you disappointed you're not hosting the Olympics, and he said, I've never done the Super Bowl, I've never done the World Series, 
I've never done the final four. Um, you know, I'll listen to all these things. Do you think I've had a bad career? So I don't view it as I need to tick off boxes on my resume. I, I have had, and I think I'm having a dream career. I love what I do. Mm. I, I, I have, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I love what I do. And I don't view it as if I don't call a Stanley Cup final, my career is incomplete at all. If my career ended tomorrow, I would, I would not have any regrets. So I don't, I don't view it that way at all. I, uh, I, I'm very fortunate that I have a signature event that is kind of tied to, you know, regardless of when I retire and regardless of what I do from here on out, I'll be known as the voice of the world junior. And I'm, more than happy with that. Will you ever not do it? Like until you retire, will you always do World Junior Games, or is there ever a thought of taking a Christmas off? I think I'll always do it. I think I and I and I would like I would like to think that whenever I do retire, the last thing I do will be the World Junior. I would like I would like my I would like my last thing to be the World Junior. What city do you want it in? Doesn't matter. No matter. Uh, I, I don't know because okay. that would be this year and I would, I would prefer my well, career it, didn't end this year. I'm sure it'll be, I'm sure it'll be back soon, but I, I like, yeah, I, yeah, no, I, I, no, I just, um, yeah, I really, yeah, I, I've really thought about it. Like I'm 56. So I, you know, I'd like to keep going probably another oh, yeah. 10 years at least. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, just, I really, I really thought about, you know, how you're the first person to ask me that. I, I I, I, I would like, yeah, I guess I would like my last thing to be the world junior. I'd like to sign off from the world junior as my last thing. Oh, I think that'd be amazing. Um, Gord, I've taken enough of your time. You've always been very good to me. And you talked about, uh, you love what you do. You can see it in every broadcast or hear it. Uh, the way you call a hockey game is it's like soothing on the ears. So uh, we appreciate the work you do, especially covering the Ottawa senators because we get, I think we're spoiled here in the nation's capital with the way that you call hockey games because it's a national feel. So Uh, For you to take the time for me, it's much appreciated. You've been very good to me. And for all the fans, uh, thank you for the work you do. My pleasure. Thank you. There goes Gord Miller, voice of the Ottawa Senators and the NHL on TSN. uh, He does lots of fantastic work throughout the year. Of course, uh, watch him this Christmas, as usual, on the World Junior Broadcasts. All right, welcome back to the show. And Meth, I got to ask you, uh, since you didn't get a chance to talk to Gord, one of the things I've always noticed in rinks, especially around players like Sidney Crosby or whoever it is, big name players, always gravitate to the play-by-play guy. And they always seem to have all the time in the world to give to Gord Miller or Chris Cuthbert or Jim Houston or, or Bob Cole, whoever it is. Is there a re- like? Is it because they never really say anything about the player? They just call the game and there's all the respect because you just listen to them call the game? I think, yeah, I think so. I think well, particularly some of the guys that you name Wally, I mean, these are, these are gentlemen that have been around for a long time. So I think from a player's point of view, you just have so much respect for them. Right. And, and it's not just the play-by-play guys. It's also the color guys. Like I still remember being in New York during the 2017 run and it was Pierre Maguire. He pulled me aside when I was warming up really briefly. He was very respectful and he was just giving me some nice compliments about how I've been playing during the playoffs. And I, I, I was, I loved it. You know, it made me really happy to hear him say that. And not only that, but it just being able to chat with him a little bit and pick his brain. Cause he's such a knowledgeable guy. And the same applies to Gord and Chris and all these other play, uh, all the other uh, play-by-play guys. They're just, they're very interesting people and they've got a lot of stories to share and rarely we get a chance to cross paths with them. Right. But you're so aware of them, you know, they're up there, but we hardly ever actually run into them. So when you do, um, you've got nothing but time and respect for those guys. And it's always sort of been that way. As we welcome into the show, Craig, I apologize. I just meant to bring you in earlier. Uh, <laughs> That's all good. What's going on, guys? <laughs> is uh, the one of the things I think is Gore gets the, uh, I guess the attention for, or it makes it easier in the relationship is he's called the world juniors. So all those kids now know who Gord is because they've listened to him call True. a game. And, and so if you're a player, is it kind of neat when you hear, whether it's Bob Cole you grew up with or Gord Miller, who's been, you know, called you at a world junior game or whatever it is. Uh, is there just a certain kind of coolness to it? Like being in a video game? I think so. Uh, and it depends on the player, right? Like some guys don't really pay attention. Yeah. Um, I, I never really paid attention 
earlier on in my career, because I was so consumed, right? Like I was so consumed in my own play and establishing myself that I never really paid much attention to that. But then as the years kind of progress and you get more established, you realize who's calling the games all the time and you start really noticing the names because I never played at the world, at the world juniors and stuff like that. So I wasn't really overly familiar, but absolutely correct. Wally. I mean, from a player's point of view, you've got nothing but respect for these guys. Cause first of all, you know, how hard the job is, right? Like it's not an easy thing to do to call a game like that and to do it with grace and be so, um, so in tune with each player and all the names and calling the play on the spot on the fly and the same flies for the color guys. So um, it's, it's always in a very interesting dynamic. And I think as you progress and get a little older in the NHL, you start to appreciate it just a little bit more. Brent, have you ever called a game? Have you ever thought about is that something you'd, you'd ever want to do? I have called, not a hockey game, I've called uh-huh. um, World Cup Beach Volleyball that was in Montreal. <laughs> and I have done play-by-play for horse jumping. I don't know if you call it play-by-play. And I also nice. did a series one time in Ottawa at the Brook Street on uh, the World Extrication Championships where they mm. I did play-by-play for them trying to get Victims out of cars in a scenario. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, Sweet. the World Firefighter Challenge, that's what it was called. Anyway, that's what I've done play-by-play on. Did you like it? Do you like doing play? Is that something you no. – like, Do you think? how do you think you'd do it at hockey? I mean, I imagine you'd, you'd be pretty good. You talk hockey all the time. Oh. Do you think you could do it? Do you think you could play-by-play or color a game? I could Re- do realistic. play-by-play. Like, so I can see a, a set – like, Meth would know. Like, you can see players on the ice. You just know who they are, right? So you don't need to see numbers mm-hmm. or names. So when you watch Ottawa all the time, you just know who's on the ice. So I could probably do the name thing properly. I just don't think I could call a game fluid with the right flow. Like I'd be, I, the problem is I would be watching sometimes like, cool. Oh, cool. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I get that too. <laughs> right. You sure. just get, so you just yeah. zone out anyway. I, yeah. Calling play by play in a national hockey league game or anything that's broadcast across the country. That is a daunting thing to me. Oh, man. And it's so hard. Like, I don't think people understand how difficult it is. Or maybe they do. Like, you have to know and study every single player out there. And not just, like, get their names and their numbers. Like, you've got tidbits of information, little yeah. sound bites that you have for each player. And the same goes for the play-by-play guys. Or like, or excuse me, the, the color guys. Hey, Wally, when you're at ice level and you're watching the game and you're trying to call the game and there's pucks and sticks flying everywhere and you're coming up with these clever one-liners and, and trying to chime in occasionally. I could not imagine having to do that. It's, yeah. it, it looks incredibly difficult. I, well, one thing I, I actually forgot to ask for this and I meant to was how do you prepare when you're calling three international hockey games back to back to back, right? So oh. you've just went through 40 guys and now it's another 40 that you don't watch all the time because they play in yeah. Latvia to be able to do that and to do it like you've been covering the team forever is a skill unto no other. Like we don't appreciate how good these guys really are. I don't think. I agree. I totally agree. And like, you almost have to have an element of being able to BS people too. Like there's, there's almost like a, a weird skill to it when maybe you don't know a certain player that's handling the puck, but you can deflect with like another weird comment about another guy. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. Yeah. Like, well, that's like Bob Cole was classic for it. He'd be like, yeah. well, the, you know, the Sens move the puck out of the right. So you'd start just throwing yeah, it up exactly. as Ottawa clears the zone. <laughs> yeah. That's right. But yeah. here's so one it, thing I, yeah. so like they're up in the press box, like the play-by-play guys are, I don't know, whatever it is, 300 feet away from the ice. I, yeah. Whatever that number is. But they can tell sometimes they go, yeah, deflected and off. I'm like, how did you see that go off his stick? So I, I don't that get one it either. always is amazing to me. Is Same. How well they I agree. That. Yeah. Anyway. One thing you asked, um, Gord was kind of the name pronunciation thing. Matthew, you don't have like a hard name, but you got a silent T at the end of your name. Is that, and well, it's not a silent T, but in, uh, Wait, in some cases, okay, sorry, go ahead. NHL game, video game, one of the first ones, and it's um, the old ESPN play-by-play guy, um, not Van Horn. Uh, oh, I can't think of his name right now. He called you Matho. Yeah, well, that was common when I first got into the league because mm-hmm. I have such a weird kind of unique last name. So I... <laughs> It was frustrating for a while because I'd have to it, oftentimes when I got into the league, the timekeeper and the and the announcer would reach over and like get my attention in the box when I'd take a penalty and they'd ask me just to confirm how I pronounced my last name. And I had to do that. I don't know how many times. Really? Until, yeah. Until finally they'd get it right. And then, yeah, it was it was annoying initially. But again, that was the name I've been given. So I had to run with it. <laughs> I, I was always when they first when I first played that game and it's like, here's Matho in the corner. I'm like. 
how, what? How do you not like that? You have one job and that is to know the players in the game anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I was curious about that. I had it. I listen, boys. I my hockey career wasn't as illustrious as Mark. My thoughts or anything, but I had I played a game. I think it was on local Rogers, and they they screwed up my name. Now my name's a disaster, <laughs> so I'm not shocked. <laughs> but they screwed it up so badly, they started changing letters, and I actually they changed my ethnicity a little bit because I was Craig McDagus the entire game. So no one nice. uh, the joke. The joke is nobody really like. Oh, that's not you. So anyway, I had it bad. I was curious <laughs> if you had it. Just just that. I don't know. Thomas Shabbat's another one too, right? Like that's a very French name. He's very French, but yeah. got that hard T at the end. So maybe, maybe, maybe you guys can get together because uh, Bates Bataglia didn't do any, didn't do me any. Oh favors. right, yeah, I played with Bates. I played with him in Syracuse. Yeah, he's a good that's, dude. That's and, a yeah, silent tough, tough last name. That's a silent G, and uh, he just he just didn't want to fight it, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. anyways, uh, hey, you know what else we can fight a little bit here is uh, we got uh, uh, some hot sauce to give away. Bone saw, nice. They're back. Um, uh, and we got some some good stuff to give away based off of the conversation that we did with Gord. So we're going back to a classic question as well to win yourself some bone saw sauce from our dear friends at Bone Saw Sauce. Go check out uh, all their stuff on the website. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but classic question: What was Gord's Gord Miller's favorite snack? If you know the answer to that, head on over to Twitter and uh, use the hashtag Walling the Thought, and uh, yeah, we'll find out the winner and we'll slide into your DMs in the near future. But yeah, bone saw. We got new sauce, Brent. What do you know about it? Yeah, I call it, and I—I I don't know why I thought of us right away. Call it game over. Uh, it's supposed to be really good. So if you're in Navin this weekend, go to the Navin Market. Go see Matt. He's—he'll have his thing set up with all the spices, all the hot sauces there. Uh, go check them out. It, they actually do some really good sauces, as you guys are well aware. Uh, it's called Game Over. It is bone sauce sauce, as we like to say, bringing the heat to hot sauce. I like it. Is it? Is it spicy? Is it like a spicy one? I imagine it's hot sauce, so it's got to be somewhat spicy. It's but it's called is this another Game one? Over. That's why I'm asking. The last, the final boss was pretty hot, but I mean, I, so you beat the boss like game over. Is that final even boss? Final boss. Like I, I had a, my tongue was burnt for like an hour after that one. So I went and, and I started with that one by accident. It was called final boss 2000 or whatever it was. Anyway. Yeah. It, it's excellent, but it was a little too aggressive to start. I think you gotta, it's, there's more of like a progression to it. Mm-hmm. You gotta work your way into it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, he makes, he makes a good product. It's good. Pretty stuff. good. Pretty tasty. Yeah. All right. Uh, Once again, that's our show for Thursday. We will see you back here on Monday uh, as we work to go live around one o'clock. We'll let you all know over the weekend. Uh, For Craig and Meth, have a great weekend, everybody. Enjoy the games. We'll see you Monday. That's the Wally Mathod Show.